Hello, welcome to Local Anesthetic Podcast, your regular injection of mind-numbing local news. This is episode 368 now, and as always, we are joined by Rob. Hello there, Rob. How are you? You're looking well. Although uh, you yeah. got a cold, didn't you say? Didn't yeah, you I think, I don't, well, I thought I had yesterday. Uh, I certainly felt quite lousy. Um, although it does seem to have cleared. Um, I just, I wonder if it's just... It's been quite muggy recently. It, I wonder if that's been yeah, sort of yeah. contributing towards it. Yeah, change in temperatures can do that and, and various things. Yeah, maybe it was more of an atmospheric thing. I liked you using the word lousy. You don't hear that often now. <laughs> so I felt lousy. Yeah, well, it, it, at the time it felt, it felt relevant, you know. Um, but no, I, I, I seem to be okay. Um, I, I, yeah, I... It, I don't know what else to say, really. Uh, yeah, yeah let, let's just crack on. Uh, is there any news? I'm anxious no. to get on with our stories, Rob. We've got lots of them. Yeah, there's actually no news either. So, yeah, we can, we can literally uh, get, get into the meat of local news. If that makes right, sense. Rob, well, 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 unfortunately, this isn't going to be too lo- This is local in regards to the universe, Rob. It's from right. USA Today. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you were inhabitants of... The universe, I don't know what that means, we all are. Let's say you're God and you're looking down at the universe or, you know, purveying the universe. This would be like a local story because it involves CERN, Rob, on the tiny planet Earth. Okay. Um, it's by Kudiksha Koshi for, the, for USA Today. Um, fact check, scientists at CERN are not opening a, in quotes, portal to hell. <laughs> Now, this is very, uh, again, obviously, we, we have mentioned this podcast that um, uh, we don't, you know, discuss stories in advance. And I was literally just listening to an episode of uh, of QAnon Anonymous. Uh, and apparently, there's been a lot of um, concerns around certain conspiracy theorists that, because uh, apparently CERN's been switched off since 2012, apparently. Um and they were concerned that it, it, was, it was turned on again recently, and they're trying to maintain that in 2012 it shifted the, the planet Earth and the cosmos into this alternative dimension. Were you aware of this? Right. No. no. Uh, well, apparently they, they, they were concerned. What, what an alternative dimension where there are QAnon supporters and Donald Trump got into power? Is that what they're talking about? Well, th- th- yeah, yeah, apparently so, yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, they, they believe we're on the, the dark timeline. Um, so they're concerned that once someone gets turned on, turn on again, then uh, could have an impact. But what, what's your story about, though? Uh- in April, scientists at the European Organisation for Nuclear Research, or CERN, restarted their particle accelerator, the world's largest and most powerful accelerator, after a three-year hiatus. So it seems that fact check might be wrong that it hasn't been off since 2012. Right. <laughs> the accelerator, the Large Hadron Collider, has undergone repairs and upgrades, and scientists plan to use it to crash protons together and learn more about the origins of the universe. Nevertheless, social media uses users are suggesting that the machine has a different purpose. A Facebook post shared July 5th shows a TikTok video of a woman who claims CERN scientists are using the machine to open a doorway for demons. So this sounds like the... the, the yes, this is what the they were talking, talking about. about. Yeah, yeah exactly right. that. If y'all don't know about CERN, it's a demonic stroke evil machine that opens up portals to other dimensions, stroke hell, stroke other spiritual worlds, in brackets, not heaven or bosom of Abraham, and it brings in demons, wicked spirits, stroke high evil principalities. Reads the caption of the post. Catchy, catchy. Um, yeah. Caption. Yep. Um, similar posts have amassed hundreds of interactions on Facebook and Twitter, I'm sure. Nick Clegg and uh, Mark Zuckerberg Mark Zuckerberg will be proud. But the claim is baseless, Rob. There's no evidence scientists at CERN are engaged in anything other than scientific-related activities. Physics experts told USA Today that scientists use the Large Hadron Collider to collide particles at very high energies to study matter. Um, and basically they say... To create a black hole or a wormhole, even a microscopic one, with our current technology in the context of our standard theories of gravity, we would need an accelerator as big as the whole universe. There is no chance whatsoever to create such a portal at CERN because basically um, um, it, it involves creating sort of elementary particles. Alex, if you're a scientist at CERN, when you hear people spouting this kind of absolute shit, <laughs> and then you have to make a statement just to make it absolutely clear that they're not opening, in quotes, a portal to hell. What must be going through your mind? <laughs> um, 
Well, I think I I think one of the things that probably goes through their mind, Rob, is that um, there's an increasing awareness in today's society that you coming out and even making a statement to try and assuage people's fears tends to make the situation worse, i.e., well, you would say that and you become an even bigger part of the conspiracy. I sometimes wonder if you're just better off not saying anything. I mean, uh, but then again, it's true. Do, 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 do you see what I mean? This, yeah. this happens continually. You're right, because we, we are in the post-truth age and it really is. It's kind of... It, it reminds me of, of the witch trials, you know, whereby... You know, uh, if if you obviously when they used to dunk witches, whereby if you were, you know, if you drowned within, you know, uh, a lake or river, you were not a witch, therefore been proved innocent. Uh, and if you if you were a witch, i.e., you floated at the top, you were burnt at the stake. So mm. it's really you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. And I can imagine, you know, if the scientists came out and said, yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. Um, you know, you, you know, you should welcome the demons with open arms. I mean, they literally cannot win. Well, also, but also, also, I take, I honestly take the view, and I don't know if it's a bit defeatist and everything like that, but I think to myself, look, if there really is a grand conspiracy going on where the top minds in our planet are opening portals to other dimensions and welcoming demonic entities, there's very little we can do about it. I mean, literally, fuck all. Um, (laughs) What I mean by that is like this conspiracy, it requires, uh, you know, and technology beyond anything we can even imagine. So I guess what I'm saying is like, well, what, okay, 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 let's say that you're never going to know that that's 100% true. And even if you did, what the hell are you going to do about it? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. And also, yeah, I mean, this is the whole thing about conspiracy theorists because they believe in these theories, but in most cases, they are powerless to do anything against it whatsoever. So, yes, or, you know, yeah. by all means, fill your boots. But um, it's going to happen anyway. Rob, talking about, look, I mean, some of this reminds me of, um, in the movie 2001, Rob, by Stanley Kubrick, of course, there is a conspiracy, isn't there? The conspiracy is that we are, that that the powers that be are actively shielding from the human populace uh, information pertaining to extraterrestrial life. Mm. And the movie itself, of course, also deals with the theme of artificial intelligence, which moves me very, very nicely onto my next story from the traitorous Guardian. It's a beautiful okay. segue, Rob. It's by John Henley by the 24th of July. Chess robot grabs and breaks finger of seven-year-old opponent. <laughs> this, is, this, this is brilliant. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. I, I, I really hope you... I'm pleased you didn't see this. No, I haven't seen Played this. by human... Played by humans, chess is a game of strategic thinking, calm concentration and patient intellectual endeavour. Violence does not usually come into it. The same, it seems, cannot always be said of machines. Last week, according to Russian media outlets, a chess-playing robot, this is in Moscow, apparently unsettled by the quick responses of a seven-year-old boy, grabbed and broke the boy's finger during a match at the Moscow Open. Oh, (laughs) The robot broke the child's finger, Sergei Lazarev, president of the Moscow Chess Federation, told TASS news agency after the incident, adding that the machine had played many previous exhibitions without upset. This is, of course, bad, he said. Rob, you want to say something? (laughs) <laughs> it's, it's good that he's clarified that um, is it really bad that I, I really hope there's a video uh, I would like to see that I don't know why I, don't, I mean I don't want to see a, you know not, I'm not saying I enjoy watching children having their fingers broken but just I'd just like to see what had happened really absolutely so um, basically the robot appeared to pounce after it took one of the boy's pieces not a euphemism rather than waiting for the machine to complete its move the boy opted for a quick riposte There are certain safety rules and the child apparently violated them. When he made his move, he did not realise he first had to wait. This is an extremely rare case. Uh, Lazarev had a different account saying the child had made a move and after that we needed to give time for the robot to answer, but the boy hurried and the robot grabbed him. Either way, the robot suppliers were going to have to think again. Are they blaming the child for for having his finger broken? So they're maintaining that apparently the the robot needs time to respond. Uh, and the child moved too quickly, and so his punishment was he had his finger broken. Yeah, he violated the safety rules, Rob. Um, uh, but but the good news is that Christopher, whose finger was put in a plaster cast, did not seem traumatised by the attack. Uh, the quote from Lazar- Lazarev said, The child played the very next day, finished the tournament, and volunteers helped to record the moves. His parents, however, were report- have reportedly contacted the public prosecutor's office. Um, the machine, which can play multiple matches at a time and reportedly already played three on the day it encountered Christopher, was unique. 
It's performed at many opens. Apparently, children need need to be warned. It happens. That's a quote. Um, a Russian <laughs> Grand Master. <laughs> it's a, like Alan Ames quote, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> at that time. Um. Anyway, let, let's let, let's move on to my next story. Okay. It's from the Times of London. Uh, there's no journalist listed, but it is from Wednesday, July 27th, 2022. And it's one of those stories that I did look for the local version, but, you know, couldn't really find it or didn't look hard enough. OK, so the headline is Optician thought woman in yoga pose was flirting. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, right. Well, I, I'm, I'm assuming she, she wasn't in a yoga pose whilst, um, whilst having an optician appointment. Uh, well, no, you're here. So, an optician has been suspended after he mistook a female patient's yoga moves in his shop for flirtation. The sport enthusiast had tilted her head down and bent forward when trying on a pair of glasses to make sure they stayed on when she performed her postures. <laughs> John Snellgrove, 64, claimed he believed the woman had been carrying out a move he thought was called the Dirty Dog Sorry. and was oscillating her posterior in a provocative way to get his interest. So, where... <laughs> <laughs> Where exactly had he got this from? I mean, I, 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 well, I'm it's confused. because she 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 bent over, right? She's trying on a pair of glasses. She tilts her head down. She bends over, and he thinks that she's carrying out a move called the dirty dog, and is oscillating her posterior in a provocative way to get to elicit his interest. Rob, and that evening. So, what do you think he did, Rob? So that evening, Snellgrove like we all would, based in St Albans, Hertfordshire, texted the unnamed healthcare professional to ask him if she was interested in, in quotes, taking it further. The shop <laughs> woman told him no. No. Sorry. I, I, this is just bizarre. Two days later, the woman, named only as patient A, had to make an une- uneasy return to his shop, enhanced optical services to collect her glasses. She then complained. And he's been uh, suspended for six months and uh, they thought that his use of patient A's personal data to make his initial approach to her was self-evidently extremely serious. Because I guess Rob, that would break Data Protection Act, all of that. You're not really allowed to do that. And uh, they said he was an experienced professional and should have been well aware that what he was doing was an unacceptable breach of professional boundaries. So, uh, again, I'm just going to... I must have... Is, is, there, <laughs> is there a yoga mo- move called the Dirty Dog? Um I don't believe so. I'm going to... I'm, 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 I'm slightly confused. Where has he got this terminology from? Is it like a... I'm, I'm concerned that maybe he's been reading a lot into sort of dog dog presenting or dog sex. And, <laughs> and so that's how he's interpreted it. I can't believe there's a yoga move called Dirty Dog. That there, there isn't. There isn't. I'm looking up here. So there Alex, isn't. where has he got this from? Why, why did he think that that would be any sort of come on? Rob, all I'll say is, alongside Mr. Snellgrove's other crimes, we shouldn't be accusing him of uh, bestiality. Th- th- that's probably wise, yeah. Um, Alex, after um, you made the shocking revelation that uh, you've never been to Greg's, no, uh, or at least never purchased an item from Greg's. This is going to be a Greg special this week. Um, so I have two stories uh, to feature, um, and both of them are significant. I feel uh, and will really help. Sorry, you've got uh, two Greg's related stories. Isn't, yes, right, isn't that a lot of uh, free advertising for them? No, on this podcast, Rob? Uh, Alex. I feel that this podcast is about the level of that Greg's might consider sponsorship. <laughs> so you know, I really think we should be pushing for that. Okay. Um, so my first story is from the Evening what, Standard. You may have would, heard about this. What I would this. say, Rob, um, is I think it would cheapen the podcast to be associated with Greg's. Local anaesthetic podcast sponsored by Greg's. <laughs> no, I, th- I think I can think that will go down quite well, actually. And I mean, it, just imagine lifetime, a lifetime supply of sausage rolls. I mean, you know, I, I do enjoy a Greg's sausage roll, uh, not as, as frequently <laughs> as you make out, but uh, on occasions, I, you know, I am partial to one. Um and, uh, um, you know, if there's some sort of monetary incentive as well, even better. Um, anyway, so this is from the Evening Standard. Uh, the article is from uh, the 29th of July. And uh, there's no, no journalist listed, but the, the headline is Greg's in row with Met Police over, over late night sausage rolls at flagship Leicester Square Bakery. Right. First of all, did you know that uh, that Greg's has opened a flagship store in Leicester Square? The only thing, right? The only thing I ever think about Leicester Square, right, is you know I know it's adjacent to Leicester Square, 
is is that bloody M and M store? It's bizarre. It's like four floors or five floors of just M and M memorabilia and yeah. And I don't understand why anyone psychedelic. It's weird. Yeah, it, I mean, it's it's just, I mean, it's purely for tourists, uh, yeah. and you just buy go there to to pay over the odds for. I mean, just shitty M and M's merchandise, but uh, but now you can also visit this this flag uh, this flagship Greg's Bakery as as well. Um, but look, Greg's face, faces a battle with police over the late night sale of sausage rolls at its flagship Leicester Square shop. The bakery chain wants permission to serve hot food twenty four hours a day in its new West End location, which currently closes at eleven pm. Uh, um, let me just say that's a problem, right? Because when people are walking through Leicester Square pissed, they are going to gravitate towards sausage rolls like sharks to chum. <laughs> chum, there's a reference we've had it in a long time. Yeah. Not, in, not entirely sure chum's even a thing anymore. But we should open up a restaurant, Rob, an eatery, some sort of eatery. Chum. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it sounds disgusting, Alex. I mean, it, it, it sounds like something... Okay, what about tripe? I mean, I, I feel that's worse. I mean, <laughs> tripe at least it, it gives you an idea of what you're eating. Chum just sounds like it, it whatever it is, it's it's going to be, what, what was the expression? Mechanically recovered. Mechanically recovered, yeah. But our slogan could be, you get what you're given. <laughs> yeah, just some beige or potentially brown meat uh, in a roll. Good episode, Dyle. Um By the way, I would just like to clarify that we're not making that association with Greg's in any way. No. Um However, police and Westminster councillors have railed against the plans. Um, PC Adam DeWeltz wrote to the Town Hall Licensing Committee saying the, the force believes a late night license will add crime and disorder in the world famous tourist destination. Um, it is our belief, uh, if granted, the application could undermine the licensing objectives in relation to the prevention of crime and disorder. The hours Greg seeks are beyond that of Westminster's core hours, uh, core, core hour policy. Um, now, I will, will just say, Alex, now, unfortunately, um, the Westminster City Council has heard them uh, and has turned down the application. So at this point in time, you can only buy uh, Grey's Sausage Rolls until 11 p.m., uh, sadly. Now, look, look, no, no, let's move on to the next story because I feel this is even more uh, fitting. Um, so this is from the Manchester Evening News. Uh, it is by uh, Hannah Kelly from the 30th of July, so literally the day after. Mm. And I'm, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, Alex, but uh, uh, Greg's and Primark have, uh, have have gone into business together. I wasn't aware of that, but it works, Rob, because um, they're similar brands, similar brand identity in a way, similar clientele. Um, mate, the only thing that would really complete that would be a trifecta, including Asda. Yeah. So uh, the headline is, I dressed almost head to toe in Greg's Primark range and had one, only one complaint. <laughs> that I look, uh, I look like an employee from Greg's. Why would, why would somebody want to look like an employee from Greg's? Uh, where I, I'm confused. Well, Alex, this is why I think you're wrong. I, this is why I feel you're, you're out of touch with a common man because, um, well, look, let's get into the story. So uh, on a chilly day in February, a sausage roll appeared in the window of a Primark. <laughs> why was it there? What could it mean? Was it a prank or simply a mistake? No. It was the start of a collaboration that no one expected, but everyone would want. Soon after, Greg's and Primark launched their collection. It sold out, with reports suggesting people were selling items online for more than three times their original price. Any comments on that? Right. Can you explain to me, Rob, me genuinely, why people want to wear a t-shirt with Greg's on it? People don't really wear t-shirts with McDonald's on it or Subway. No, do you know why that is, Alex? Because they're both American brands. Greg's is a homegrown British brand, and people are proud to represent it in the street. Right, okay, but what's next then? A collaboration between Primark and Timps Timpsons? <laughs> <laughs> Alex, no one wants to wear a T-shirt with Timpsons on. Come on. <laughs> Timpsons for me... Timpsons is always... I don't know, it feels like... I mean, let's face it, when was the last time you went into a Timpsons? Um, well, a little while ago to get my keys cut. I mean, you know, it's... it's hand exactly. Handy place to go occasionally. You do realise, right, that if you think about it, Timpsons is the retail equivalent of Australia. <laughs> go on. Um, it's made up of ex-convicts, Rob. 
Okay, right. Uh, <laughs> what else I like about Timpsons is, no, no, regardless of where... Hang on, the guy, the guy I want to make clear, the guy who runs Timpsons, the guy who set it up, the founder, he is a wonderful human being. He's he a model of how to do business. He's a model of how to rehabilitate ex-prisoners. Um, he does a lot of work around mental health. He, yeah, I, I, I was aware of that. Also, I mean, it, if it wasn't for Timpsons... The manufacturers of those little, like, um, you know, those little cobblers they always have the window, the one that's always banging the nail, nail into the shoe, the little, like, uh, not robot, but the little, like, animated figure. You know, they are single-handedly keeping that that company in business. You're right, Rob. Um, yep. So, but now it's back and bigger than ever. I headed down to the snack bus in, in, cathedral, in cathedral Gardens and got my hands on head-to-toe Greg's fashion. <laughs> God. First, I really need to look this up, Rob. Let me look this up, okay? I need I need to see what the hell you were talking about. Yeah. Um, Rob, there are trainers. There are Greg's trainers. Uh, yes, there Primark are. Primark Greg's trainers. <laughs> yeah. But there's a hoodie. So there, there are four items there's, you there's can a, find. There, there's a T-shirt with a sausage roll on it um, that I'm looking at here. Black T-shirt, black and white picture of a sausage roll, and underneath it says, Iconic. And the model who's wearing it is holding a pair of Greg's branded beach sandals. Oh, there's Rob. more than four items. Sorry, there's t- there's at least two bucket hats and two t-shirts. Yeah, there's one. There's the t-shirts. The yeah, Rob, you know those um, you know those Letterman jackets. Yes. Um, like you know, in America, think about you know an American student, you know, just finished high, just got out of high school, and he's wearing his so he's wearing his jacket, and it's got like a an A on the breast or a B, um. Uh, and the, the, there's one just like that. It's sort of blue, but but where the, on it very much looks like a Letterman jacket. But where the letter would be is the Greg's logo, which basically is a poor imitation of the Microsoft Windows logo. To be to be absolutely fair, <laughs> right? Okay. This none of this makes any sense to me. Look, look, look as the, as the as the article says. Firstly, the hats, the wonderful bucket hat. It's a staple of Mank fashion, as we all know, and one to be seen all across festivals. So, this sorry, summer. sorry. Are you saying people are buying this in Manchester? Because that makes sense now. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, it is for the MEM. This is formal uh, attire there, Rob. Right. Um, uh, there have been iconic bug bug hats for years gone by. The, the, the IKEA hat, apparently, worn by Kevin and Perry, uh, one of which of the assuming thousands. Uh, Liam Gallagher decides to pop on his head at a show. But now Greg's have joined the ranks with their reversible hats. One side is black. Uh, chic with an embroidered uh, stamp logo, while the other has the, the pattern all over. Um, and she goes on to say, obviously, uh, that the one word she mentioned is comfort. Apparently, the hat is very comfortable. I purchased, I purchased two T-shirts. Both are 100% cotton, and one says Greg's. Uh, the other is a graphic tee and has a picture of a sausage roll on a stick with the logo flakes included. Don't really understand the reference. Um, they are comfortable, no fuss t-shirts, designed as men's t-shirts. I got them in large and they are true to size. However, the black logo can, can be better applied as the XXX material feels like it, it could peel off once given a wash or two, which is not really a surprise. No, uh, um, Rob, wait a second, wait a second. Would you wear like mini cheddar themed clothing? Uh, I, I, I wouldn't, Alex, no. <laughs> no. Um, you know. or is, there any, is there any food that you consume uh, that you would endorse on your clothing? Um, Tizer? Monster Munch, um, Twiglets. Uh, mon- I, I would say Monster Munch definitely. I, I wouldn't be a, <laughs> I wouldn't be um, repelled by a Monster Munch T-shirt. I mean, also I think the branding is iconic. I mean, the fact that they had to bring back the the, uh, the 1980s branding because there was such a demand for it. Um, trying to think, well, so I, I would I, I wouldn't mind repping. Um, there's probably some biscuits in there as well. Maybe I oh, know I said Jammy Dodger. I don't like a Jammy Dodger. How about you? Is there anything that, you, that stands out? Uh, I'm not really. Sh- I'm not really sure. Maybe a bit of cheese, actually, just like a baby bell. Yep, baby bell, baby bell. That'd be nice. Baby bell on a t-shirt. It's the way to go. It is. Okay, Rob. Listen, without buying ironic or sarcastic, because I'm struggling here. Can you please explain to me why people would be attracted to branded Greg's attire? Because I see Greg's as like a double H Smiths, right? Somewhere you just pop into. Why on earth would anybody be buying this? Uh, this clothing range. But I think you've kind of said it. I think that people wear this ironic... I mean, first of all, Greg's is a beloved national brand. There's no two ways around that. Is it? Uh, yeah, again, you really need to go in, Alex. And you, you know, <laughs> uh, Listeners were baffled that you've never been into a Greg's, uh, right. as am I. I mean, we're, my suggestion would be we are seeing each other in the near future 
for Lyra's christening. Maybe. Bro, I'm not popping out to Greg showing my future goddaughter's christening. I hadn't finished. No. <laughs> I hadn't finished, Alex. Let me let me finish. We should pop out. <laughs> to, to um, but, I, you know, you don't have to get sausage rolls. It says to you before, you can have a sweet treat. You could have one of their many sandwiches on offer. They do tuna sandwiches. I know you're very partial to I a am. tuna sandwich. Um, I, also, their, their, their coffee as well. Their coffee is, is actually quite passable. Is there a Greg's near your workplace, you know, where you work? Is there one there? Um... I don't think... Oh, yes, there is. Actually, there's one down the road. Right, yeah. So maybe I come up there and we go out for lunch one day to Greg's. That seems bleak. <laughs> maybe I, I would feel that maybe we can get lunch from somewhere else, maybe to stop in at Greg's on the way. <laughs> but uh, I think eating in at Greg's is, is next level. Although, um, yeah, I know people do do that. Okay, mate. Now I've got a, just just a brief story here, kind of an update to to a theme that we know and love. It's from the Traitorous Guardian. Um, the headline is sorry. The journalist is Raphael Boyd from Monday, the first of August, and the headline, Rob. I mean, it won't come as much of a surprise. Unhappy campers. Pontins rated among the worst holiday parks in the UK. <laughs> I mean. Yeah, as you say, Alex, it's, it, that's, that, that doesn't come as a surprise. Uh, I'm glad that it's finally made national news. I mean, local news was having a field day covering Pontins, and I mean, to be fair, so are we. Um, so, yeah, delighted to hear this. A new ranking of British holiday parks has placed mainstay Pontins last out of 19 competitors, and big names struggled while Norfolk based Potter's Resorts claimed the crown. Never heard of them. The table compiled by which was created by surveying 1,355 members on how they rated their stays at holiday parks throughout the UK categories of cleanliness, quality of accommodation, customer service, facilities, entertainment, food and drink, and value for money were rated on a scale from one to five. Which travel editor Guy Hobbs said the survey saw smaller, family-run resorts triumph over the big names. So there's no need to go for the most expensive option, Rob. You'll be pleased to hear to have a great experience. Right. Um, I'm going to skip all this. I'm just going to talk about Pontins. It's... Um, its quality of accommodation received only two stars in the category, which I'm surprised about out of five. I would have thought it would be one. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's entertainment and value for money getting the same rating. The former family holiday heavyweight's poor standing isn't a new experience for its owner, Britannia Hotels, which has rated it Britain's worst hotel chain for nine consecutive years. Can I, I, I see... I've never stayed in a Britannia hotel, but I, I'm I'm aware of of many of them. I think the 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 one in Manchester, and if anyone knows, on, on Portland Street is notoriously bad. <clears throat> um, but what I don't understand is if you're the I don't know, the shareholders or you know the board or even the managing director of the company. Surely, if your company's been rated the worst hotel chain nine years running, I mean, you're not actively trying to win that award, are you, Rob? I, I imagine the people who run Pontins are the kind of people who blame the customers. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a Pontins, you can, I mean, you might be right, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Pontins is like, I imagine they're like train companies are, you know, it's, it's the, it's the customer's fault. The trains don't run on time. You know, they've got too high expectations. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they, they cause grief on the, you know, they take too long getting onto the trains and all the rest of it. Yeah. I think it's that attitude. Anyway, look, let's move on from the misery of Pontins, Rob, and get on to our, the, always my highlight, the listener story of the week. And I, I've, it's only now that I've realised, Rob, that each time we record a regular episode of LA Podcast and I talk about the listener story of the week, it isn't really the listener story of the week because these, uh, these are bi-weekly, these free episodes. We have the... We have the Patreon episodes every other week, LA Extra, an ex- sorry, LA Podcast Extra, an extra jab, patreon.com forward slash LA Podcast Extra. But really, it's our listener story of the fortnight, which doesn't sound yeah, as good, that's... but it's kind of true. I'm just saying facts. Facts matter, Rob. They do. Yeah, you're correct in that. So do we, yeah, maybe we do need to change it. I mean, it could just be the listener story of the episode, but that doesn't sound as good. Very good. No, very, no, very good. Yeah. No, okay. Like so this is from Kyber. Uh, it is from the the Independent, um, and it was originally published on the twenty fifth of June by Emily Atkinson. I always I always figured um, Kyber for an independent reader. That's what I think he reads. I think that's his <laughs> newspaper of choice. 
It used to be the newspaper choice for my for my dad before he same he, here. He converted really. My dad used to read the Independent when I was growing up, and then he went to the Guardian, and now he reads the Mail. Same. Yeah, my my dad. Uh, yeah, that, that's that's bizarre. Uh, my dad was was a solid a solid Guardian reader to the end. Um, even had it delivered to his house uh, because that's just the kind of person he was. Yeah. Um, anyway. <laughs> I would like to just say that my dad does also read the Telegraph, so it's not just sort of the lowbrow, but also the highbrow right-wing press. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to know that his, his political allegiances have shifted so significantly. Um, anyway, so the this reminds me of a story, uh, well, of, of the story, I should say, of the uh, the young man whose parents uh, selflessly, or in some ways uh, selfishly maybe, uh, sold his vintage pornography collection. It reminds me of that. Uh, not sorry, not just his vintage pornography collection, but also his collection of sex toys. I um, loved that story. That was in the United States, wasn't it? That was absolutely brilliant. I can't remember what episode yes. it is. You're gonna have to go. The best thing, if you ever want, it, if you ever thinking, you know what? I remember LA Podcast um, covered a story, and I can't remember what it is. If you go to our website, lapodcast.net, there is a search bar there, and because Rob writes up headlines for the episodes, and they don't always contain every story, so this isn't this isn't a hundred percent fixed. But try and put in something approximate it, and you might find it uh, there, and it will yeah. bring up the episode. Yeah. So it, it reminds me of that also just that, that story. We never did got to the bottom the bottom of what he was doing with those sex toys. Um, but again, you know, maybe that's that's for the best. Um, also, I okay. think it might just be self-explanatory, Rob. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll explain it to you after the podcast. Right, okay, great. So, headline is, uh, Irreplaceable Vinyl Records Sold at Car Boot Sale by Mistake. Now, I think I heard about I haven't didn't read it, but I've heard about something about this, I'm pretty sure, yes. Yeah. So, uh, a woman has told of our horror off mistakenly flogging a set of, of press vinyl records for just £1 each. Uh, Sir Rowan Mellor described the 60s and 70s records sold to a man at the event in Rowsley in Derbyshire on Sunday for £15.50 pence as irreplaceable. The heritage collection, which Miss Bella said was being stored by a relative while she moved house, included albums by The Rolling Stones, The Beatles, David Bowie, ACDC, The Clash and The Who. Um, she said that rel- the, the relatively... Sorry. She said that the relative taking care of the records who had suffered a recent bereavement had mixed up the precious items uh, when she'd been cleaning out of her house. No, I'm sorry. Miss Bella said she right. was... So- I assume the relative has the grief defence. You know, they've suffered this bereavement. They're not in a right state of mind. But, you know, you've entrusted this person with them and they, you would think just, they would open the box and look through and not just take, it just seemed, it's that worst nightmare fear. It's always that thing that I think, if I, like, I'll say to my parents, if I leave this here, it's going to be here when I get back, right? You're not going to take it to a car boot sale. No, of course we won't. But this time it happened. Do you think that she told the relative when she gave her these records, look, these are irreplaceable, they're not priceless, but they're irreplaceable. They're very valuable, which they would be. Look after them. I mean, you'd hope so. Uh, and also, Alex, even I feel that even in times of grief, I would still be able to, you know, cognitively sort out uh, uh, a relative's belongings. That's very judgmental. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say, Thank cognitively you, sort it, cognitively sorting out a relative's belongings is a good episode title. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, so Mrs. Mellor said she was uh, utterly shocked and horrified that the vinyl records collected by her father and uncle had been sold. Following the death of her uncle, the Buxton residents said her father had given them to her and her sister. Um, it did not really uh, hit me properly until the next day. I was really, really upset, said the 26-year-old. Let's just talk I mean, about this guy who bought them, Rob. Let's just talk about this guy who bought them, Rob. He wouldn't have been able to get yeah. out, of his wallet, out of his wallet quick enough, right? Can you no, imagine? No, like, and you, you'd feel like theft. He must have thought, "What the fuck?" Even I would know if I was at a car boot sale and saw original Who records, Beatle records from the sixties. I'd think, "Holy shit, I'm buying this." I wouldn't look it up on eBay yeah, first. It, I wouldn't check. I'd just buy them. See, what, what I don't quite get is obviously he. I'm assuming that the guy bought the lot of them because they they were on sale for one pound each. Now, and there were sixteen. There were sixteen records there. Does that does that mean he haggled that person down by fifty p? Yeah. I know. I'm. I thought Brilliant. that. I thought. I thought that he actually stopped to haggle. Who's that fucking? He had the, he had the balls. Because I wouldn't even fucking haggle. I'd go. Look, I'll give you twenty. See ya. Yeah. <laughs> so whoever this person, this person is, fair play, mate. You know, absolute fair play. Um, Mrs. Mellor said that she was desperately hoping someone could help, uh, and wrote a post about the incident on Facebook, which 
has been seen uh, and shared more than 700 times. I'm sorry, but that person is not coming forward. <laughs> There's no way that's the case. Um, with the assistance of her husband, Rob, who will be attending this weekend's car boots out at the same location, she has contacted a number of local record dealers in a bid to find the, the Rousley buyer. Uh, Miss, Me- Miss Meller said, we are more than happy to get them back. I just want them back. It was never about the financial value of them. They were just really important. End the of trouble- the story. Well, it, I think it was about the financial. Okay, maybe. Okay, maybe it was both. Maybe it was sentimental. But this, you sold them. Somebody bought them. There's no. There is that. You know that is bus- That is business. If I, do you know what I mean? If I, put, yeah, if I, I mean, it, if I put my house up it, for sale fifty p and somebody buys it, I can say, oh shit, that was a bit of an error. I can have it back. But ultimately, the other person isn't duty bound. It all. It, it, it's all based on whether or not this guy feels like, yeah, he he wants to be yeah. he wants to be generous. That's it. Yeah, as you as you right say, Alex. I think if 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 I was this guy and had found this this vo- this box of irreplaceable records, I literally, as you said before, throw the person's money up, throw the money in the person's face, turn over their table, and just run for it. <laughs> you know, create as much of a distraction as you possibly can. And on that note, Rob, we bring this episode of LA Podcast uh, 368. No, yes, yes, 368. Of course it is. To a close, Rob. Um, and we can be found on our website. As I mentioned earlier, look, LAPodcast.net has every episode for free apart from the LA Podcast Extra bonus episodes because they are a Patreon exclusive. But all 368 of them, as of this episode, to download there. But of course, you can find them on your podcast app, everything else. If you love listening to this podcast and you ache for more, Rob, then every other week, we, Rob and I, release an episode on Patreon for our Patreon subscribers. It's called LA Podcast, an extra jab. I think, Rob, there are 27 or something like that episodes on there now. I can't remember exactly how many. I'm yep. losing count, Rob. And they're brilliant. They're fantastic. So you just go to patreon.com forward slash LA Podcast. Extra. I'll say that again. You go to yes. patreon.com forward slash LA Podcast Extra. <laughs> And you uh, and you sign up there. It's two pounds a month, and you get two episodes a month every month to your inbox. And of course, you'll have access to the whole back catalogue of all the LA Podcast Extra episodes. There, we've also stuck our Daft Talk episodes on there as an exclusive, so you get access to those as well. So it's great value for money, Rob. Whichever way you look at it. Um, but we'd really appreciate you doing that, and we really appreciate your support, regardless. Um, we're going to be back in a week's time with LA Podcast, an extra jab, and then a week after that, it will be. LA Podcast 369, Rob, as we hurtle towards 400 episodes. Uh, Thank you for listening, everybody. God bless. And keep it local.